Havana's casinos were still in business, but Castro was about to shut them down and destroy one of the mob's richest rackets. Santo Traficante was the man Giancana and Roselli thought best place to kill Castro. The mafia boss of Tampa, Florida, Traficante owned casinos in Cuba and still had many friends on the island. So they says Santo would be the logical guy to have it done because he had he was in Cuba all the time. So they went to uh, talk to uh, Santo and uh, they told Santo, you know, kill him some way. And if you do, we get all, all the favors we want from the government. So he says he would do it. Castro was now the target of an alliance between America's government and some of its worst criminals. But Traficanti did not share the enthusiasm of Roselli and Giancana. The plot to kill Castro withered away. Sano had, could have killed him in a minute. You know, I know that uh, Castro was running around there loose as a goose when he first took over there, you know. And there would have been no problem. But Sano just didn't want to do it. He didn't do it. When I had my confrontation with Giancana at O'Hare Airport, he said to me, hey, we're supposed to be on the same side, aren't we? And I really didn't know what he was talking about at that time. That went over my head, and I had no idea of what uh, the meaning of it was. But apparently what he was trying to tell me was that uh, he was working for the United States government also. Uh, we later found out that uh, uh, there was some indication that he was uh, attempting with Johnny Roselli, who was a henchman of his, to uh, poison Castro. When the Castro plot was revealed 14 years later, most Americans were shocked. Could the state really have hired gangsters to kill the head of another state? The woman who loved both the mafia boss and the president was not so surprised. The one thing I recognized was there are no black hats and there are no white hats. They all conduct themselves the exact same. And very good evidence of that is that the CIA would hire two so-called mafia men, Sam Giancana and John Roselli, to assassinate Fidel Castro. Um, if there's such a difference, you're not supposed to have anything to do with each other. But in, in essence, the remark is really they're all in bed together. They all do business together and the same way. Giancana's work for the government earned him no favors from the FBI who put him in jail in 1965. When he came out, he fled to Mexico. Eight years later, he came back, but his days as Chicago's crime boss were over. He's got in trouble. You know, they start going after him, the government start going after him. So he just took off, left the country. He, Johnny told me he had a lot of money when he left, a few million dollars, two or three million. I understand that Mexico just ripped him off. And when he come back, he was broke. And he tried to take over where he left off, and next thing I know, he's dead. At his suburban Chicago home in June 1975, Sam Giancana was shot dead. It was a classic gangland hit. He must have known and trusted his killer, for he died without a struggle. Uh, he had $1,400 on his person when they uh, checked the body, and uh, his wallet was lying next to his head uh, on the left side. Any forcible entry to the basement? There's no forcible entry that we could find. Any other people in the house at the time? The caretaker and his wife. They were, in, they were upstairs in a back room watching TV, and they said they had an air conditioner on, and they did not hear any shots. Professional job? Looks like it. For the Chicago Mafia, this was business as usual. Giancana was around the thousandth mob murder in the city since 1919. He may have been killed because he was trying to regain his leadership of the Chicago mob. But he could also have been murdered because he was going to expose the Mafia's plot to kill Castro before a Senate committee in Washington. One man who did testify in Washington was Johnny Roselli. He revealed he had been recruited by the CIA, along with Giancana. He thus broke the Mafia code of omerta, silence. He had signed his own death warrant. 
Johnny Roselli went missing one year after Giancana was murdered. Then an oil drum was found in the sea containing Roselli's body, weighed down with chains. The barrel finally surfaced in a Florida creek. No one doubted that the men who killed Giancana had also killed Roselli. The man now running the Chicago family was once again Tony Accardo, who had led the outfit before in the 1940s and 50s. Accardo wanted to quit, but the family needed him to repair the damage inflicted by the FBI during the Giancana years. Accardo shared the job with Joey Ayupa. As Chicago's joint boss, Ayupa was determined to wipe out anyone loyal to Giancana and Roselli. Ayupa knew that Roselli had worked closely with the Los Angeles Mafia boss, Jimmy Fratiano. Ayupa tested you, didn't he? He gave you a description. Yeah, he kind of gave me a test, yeah. Tell us about To see what I, uh, how I felt, you know, about the killing of Roselli. He start, uh, he said, Jimmy said, uh, remember that guy, he says he was going like this with his finger, right? The guy they found with a, in a barrel. He said, what's his name? He's looking at me in the eye, you know, I'm looking at him, right? Said, Who are you talking about? Roselli? Oh, yeah, Johnny, what do you think of that? And he's still looking at me, right? It's one of them things, yeah. What are you going to do? You know, he was waiting what I, my reaction would be, you know. So, if I would have said something like, hey, I'd like to find out who, you know, I'd have never left that room alive. These are the mob bosses of Chicago today, in a picture taken by one of their own crime family. The party celebrating at the Sicilian Manor restaurant includes Accardo, Ayupa, and their top lieutenants. That picture is so significant because it's the only time in the history I know of any mob where they all sat down to be counted and had their color photograph taken of each other. These men have America's second city by the throat. They not only control its rackets, they own policemen, politicians, labor unions, and hundreds of legitimate businesses. It's no different than American corporations like General Motors or any big company uh, uh, running a business, legitimate business. But the only thing is General Motors uh, is not taking Ill illegal money to build a car. But these, the, the uh, uh, Italian mafia there in Chicago would be then taking illegal heroin drug money and building a nice restaurant or building a glass factory or building uh, a ballpark or whatever or buying into a ballpark or buying a piece of this. All legitimate. That's the problem the government's having right now and the FBI really does have a problem because it's, you have to catch them before they put the money into legitimate business. How are you going to do it? And that's the problem. At a service station in Chicago, members of this criminal corporation gather to talk business. The boys have come a long way from bootleg booze. They still run the old rackets like gambling and money lending, but now they own restaurants, retail stores, laundries, vending machine businesses and factories. Everything the public wants to buy, they sell. They look harmless enough, even respectable, like any other group of middle-aged businessmen. But with this difference, they work for a corporation which kills the most violent mob in America. In 1983, Ken Ito, a Japanese gambling boss working under the Mafia, faced a long prison sentence. Chicago's crime bosses feared he would inform on them, so they ordered his murder. Ito was shot five times and left for dead. But he survived and told police all he knew about the outfit. Ito also named the men who had tried to kill him. One was Jasper Campisi, an old mafia soldier who had long run gambling and loan sharking for the Chicago family. The other was a policeman, John Gattuso, a deputy sheriff of Cook County. As a result of Ito's evidence, Gattuso and Campisi were charged with attempted murder. 
Out on bail, they disappeared in July 1983. They were missing for two days. Then one evening, Campisi's car was found 30 miles away from Chicago. Cameras were kept back as police prized open the boot. What? There they go. Here they go. Here they go. We got the line set up down here. You have to go to the truck, get that. Both in there, man. Both in there. Both in there. Yeah, but I can't see him. Oh, God, I can smell it. I can smell it. Incredible. Both Campisi the mobster and Gattuso the deputy sheriff had been repeatedly stabbed. Gattuso had been strangled. They suffered agonizing deaths, far from the clean executions of mafia movies. They were killed because they had failed to kill the informer Ito. Campisi, the mafia soldier, and Gattuso, the corrupt cop, were now united in death as they had been in life, part of that unholy alliance of mobsters, police, and politicians that has exploited Chicago since the days of Al Capone. Has anything got better in the last 50 years in this city? Oh, yes. If, uh, the one thing that's gotten better is that there's a little more public awareness of the fact that there is this all-pervading... Uh, influence. I can recall when we began, I had people come up to me saying, why do you bother with this? Why are you going out after these hoodlums? We have things nice the way they are. Why do you want to change them? However, if, you want to, if you're saying, is the hoodlum influence any less today than it was 50 years ago? It's more. It's just a little better hidden. You don't have an Al Capone out at the ballpark uh, eating hot dogs with the mayor. It's all going on in back rooms, but it's there. It's there as it has never been there, and one wonders if it will ever change. Oh, God, I can smell it. I can smell it. Incredible.